And welcome everybody to our panel, which is uh, uh, entitled Developing Your Ecosystem Funding to Accelerate Scale Up. Uh, so this, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, we will be uh, exploring how to enable a continuum of resources critical for any innovation journey, especially in developing countries where there are very few ecosystems. So I'd like to welcome our truly international panel here. We have uh, Robert Orr from Bedford, Nova Scotia, Swethal Kumar from the UAE, Sophia Sidoum uh, from New York here in the United States, and uh, Yulia Shahoida from Budapest, Hungary. And I will uh, be your moderator, and I'm based in Silicon Valley, um, bright and early, 545 in the morning. So delighted to be with you all. Uh, so let's uh, start. Uh, first of all, with you, Robert, uh, can you give us uh, an overview of the equity loan and grant type funding opportunities in your ecosystem? And can these funding sources be combined by a startup looking for funding? And if so, how? Well, Ron, I, I participate in a few different ecosystems. Uh, you know, we have uh, the Ocean Supercluster, which is a fairly new initiative trying to develop uh, ocean related uh, technology and building a cluster for that in in uh, Atlantic Canada, the four Eastern Canadian Atlantic provinces. Uh, then I also am chair of a, of a national organization called Natural Products Canada, which um, you know, looks at building again an ecosystem and a center of excellence nationally uh, for natural products specifically. Uh, and then obviously I participate as uh, as a, someone who leads a fund who makes investments in, in, in sustainable ocean technologies. But let me start locally. Uh, and, and I think I, I want to talk about that overall ecosystem. And one of the things that uh, Nova Scotia and Halifax in particular, which is the largest center, but not a huge center, population half a million, uh, in as the capital of no the province of Nova Scotia, they, they participated a few years ago in a program out of MIT called MIT REAP, which is a regional entrepreneurship acceleration program. Um, and and it, it focuses on this, this total ecosystem. And sometimes we think about the ecosystem quite narrowly, just in terms of risk capital and entrepreneurs. Um, but what MIT has done in studying this and studying successful ecosystems and entrepreneurship specifically around the world has been that there's a, an existing corporate uh, piece of the ecosystem. There's risk capital availability. There's entrepreneurs that are required. There's the university sector, which is required. And then there's the government uh, 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 impact on, on the ecosystem. And if these five component pieces and, and there's a component of the, of the um, community at large uh, that determines the success of, of these ecosystems. And it's the integration and the collaboration between these five areas of, of existing corporate uh, um, entities, government, universities, entre how big is the entrepreneurship base itself and the access to risk capital. So, so I think when you're looking at, at ecosystems, you know, what is the interface and collaboration that exists between those five sectors and how well can they collaborate and align behind building, uh, uh, building out uh, a successful entrepreneurial ecosystem, if you want to call it that. Yeah, I think, I think that's uh, Robert, very valid. Uh, of course, I've been in uh... Silicon Valley since the 60s, and, and you know, I think it's been well documented that uh, all of those factors uh, uh, were at work here to, to really start and promote entrepreneurship here in Silicon Valley, you know, dating all the way back to uh, early, uh, even before World War II, uh, with, with government and, and university, of course, Stanford University and, and risk capital and so on. So I think your point is, uh, points are absolutely valid. Um, other panelists' comments on, on that question before we move to the next one? You know, what I can add is uh, 
typically when it's you know when ecosystem is seen uh, a lot of see people see this more as an incubator but uh, i think in my view and in fact uh, last year when we were setting up hub center in you know, abu dhabi what we are looking at that you know how we can bring together all the key stakeholders right i think how do you kind of dovetail the the key stakeholders like of regulator government bodies uh, corporate innovation labs or maybe the research uh, facility in the academia um or bringing the you know the venture capitalists the uh, capitalists uh, and or investors uh, and the mentors right so all put together like how can you synthesize and then support those kind of creative beautiful ecosystems um uh, and that that's my take on when it's when it comes to the ecosystems and creating uh, you know adding to the uh, investors talking about the equity or or maybe the venture that bringing all in under one roof mm-hmm. okay what well, i'd like to add uh to both your comment is the fact that robert describe the the many components five of them actually that helps an ecosystem be brought to life for all those components to be able to interact together they need to be people working toward us people connecting one component with another and that is usually um not a profitable job so there has to be somewhere a political w- will to try to aggregate all the powers all the strengths that a local place have yeah i would definitely add to that what sofia was just talking about and what we see here in the ce region the central european region is that um this whole startup ecosystem started out with a lot of public funding and a lot of money coming from the eu and governments using that towards funding startups but the whole ecosystem is, and the different factors are not connected so there are a few incubators already a few mentors very very few and not enough at all angel investors so all these different players are are not connected well enough and right now there is a lot of capital in every single country in the central european region but all of this is usually public funding not a lot of funding from from outside private and investors and there's not enough deal flow coming to all this capital so not enough incubators bringing that up to the capital so it's definitely something that somehow should be connected this whole channel yeah i i i heard the tail end of the previous panel and uh, someone was uh, counseling patience <laughs> and uh, uh, we have to remember you know silicon valley got started uh, you know in technology in the in the 30s and and you know the 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 miracle didn't really happen until the 60s now i think the world the world is much faster now so it shouldn't take 30 years to develop new ecosystems but it does take time uh well listen let's move on uh, uh, to the next question and and i i want to remind the audience that uh, hopefully you all have questions and please type them in the chat window but yulia uh what are the main challenges of vc funding in your ecosystem Uh, and what types of methods uh, do VCs apply for valuation of early stage uh, companies mm-hmm. uh, and what funding routes are are typically available in your ecosystem until companies become self-sustaining mm-hmm. okay so the challenges of VCs as i just mentioned uh, uh for the previous question is actually most of the VCs in in Hungary and in the central european region are funded mostly from from EU funding that then governments allocate. So it's mostly public money, a lot of regulations that come with it, a lot of regulations that it has to be spent within that country, not really can cannot really be spent on on export and taking the startup international. So it goes um goes against what a startup should be doing and going international really fast and spending the money on that. So that's that's a big challenge. It's also a challenge that there's not that many incubators accelerators agile investors who would be bring that that deal flow ready for a vc so when when we as a vc get startups they usually don't have any documents ready for for actually coming to a vc um we pretty much have to help them get their business plans financial plans ready for that quality that we would actually want when a startup comes to us so that's definitely challenging and um yeah and then this what was the second part of your question sorry uh another so what, what you know how how do uh, startups get get funded until they're self sufficient yeah so oh, and uh, the valuation methods you know, so that's also also uh 
I think a problem here and a problem how they can then connect to international markets and international investors. So since there are no um, or very few angel investors, now there's a few also state funded programs that finance very early stage startups. So that's a possibility, but then they already have state funding with a lot of um, requirements, a lot of different uh, problems that they take onward with them. And uh, what we see is that the valuations are much lower for same quality startups here than say in the US. And this definitely is a problem because um, I think we are really looking at this and trying to take those percentages down. But you know, when this whole startup ecosystem started here, we saw VCs taking 95% of startups for our first funding round. And you know, where do you have <laughs> any place for next investors? But even now for, for a seed round, a lot of investors will take 35% of the company. And, and you know, how do you still then have place for next round investors? So this definitely is a very huge problem. And I think one of the obstacles of startups then going towards next round international investors. Great. Well, I, I would say two things, uh, Yulia. One, one is uh, as a uh, partner in a venture firm here in Silicon Valley, it's, it's amazing how, uh, how unprepared you know, many, many of the entrepreneurs are when they come into our offices too. Mm -hmm. Uh, either you know not a well-designed pitch or not a well-thought-out financial plan. So it is a that is an international problem. Uh, I would also say I you know there's an opportunity in lower valuations, um, uh, which is again we run a, a cross-border fund. We got started many years ago investing in Israel, and we're always looking for uh, places where valuations are less frothy. So if you can get connected to the international ecosystem. Uh, uh, and promote startups uh, and kind of act as that connector that that could be incredibly valuable. Uh, other uh, panelists comments on uh, on that question? Yes, Robert. Yeah, <laughs> look, the there's always a challenge at every level of of this um, ecosystem that's related to risk capital. Um, whether that's seed capital, whether that's capital that we're, that's missing in almost every system, which is the traditional valley of death when, you know, early seed capital from friends and family or even angels um, gets exhausted, uh, but there isn't enough traction in the business to get it to, you know, more traditional venture capital or even a series A. Um, and and I, I think that that building both policies as well as programs. Uh, the one thing about government is government isn't good at creating capital or creating wealth. I mean, that's, that's a known fact. They're better at redistributing wealth um, <laughs> than they are at, at creating it, but they can create programs that can, can, can encourage investment. So for instance, you can have uh, significant tax breaks for, uh, early stage and in investing up to a quarter of a million or half a million dollars. And, and say you have a region where there isn't a, a high level of sophistication for um, uh, early stage seed investing, but there's still some inherent wealth there. Then if you create these tax advantages uh, and this was done, you know, successful and uh, successfully in a state like Arkansas as an example, where, where they created in essence, a bank. And so you could, you could attract investment capital, um, seed capital from out of state. And so how does an out of state person get the, t the local tax credit? Cause you're not living in the, in the state. So they created a pool where, where people who didn't have the knowledge, know-how or risk appetite uh, could in essence bank or create a bank. So outside investors could get let's say there was a 35% uh, tax rebate, they could get 30% of it and give 5% to the people who were in the bank who were prepared to get a slight reduction in their taxes uh, by making this and contributing to the whole ecosystem. So I think that there's, again, these are innovative government policies where government shouldn't be in the business of trying to figure out who and what businesses to invest in, but can create policy and create programs that can attract both local capital and out of state or even out of country capital by creating those discounts 
until you build up an ecosystem and then you can roll back the program or change the program. So I think it's getting innovative and understanding who can play what roles in these in building up these kinds of ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And, and Robert, do you, do you see those innovative programs um, expanding? Your example in Arkansas, do you see that happening in uh, uh, other regions in the world? Um, you know, there are a number of regions, and even including Nova Scotia, where there's a, there is now a program for local, uh, you know, in-province um, rebates. Um, in our case, uh, you know, a quarter of a million dollar of investment can get a 35% uh, tax reduction. They haven't, because they, they've been able to kind of fill that bucket with local investors, haven't, you know, created a program where you got out of out of province or out of country investments. So, I mean, it, it, it depends a little bit on how big and how active your own uh, community is. But for communities that don't have a lot of uh, active investors who would take up that, that um, tax rebate, then you can bring in these other programs. So, I mean, I'm not tracking these programs all over the world, but um, you know, I, I think that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are examples when you do a global scan of things that work and don't work. And again, if governments, and another area that, that I've seen that we didn't talk about in the ecosystem is philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So government combined with philanthropy, again, philanthropists can you know, may want to do social good so they can invest in building accelerators and incubators or partner with government. You can go to some of these philanthropic organizations and have them work on incubation and, and acceleration in ways where they don't, they don't have, again, the risk appetite to be the actual investor in the, in the company. So it's building this entire network that's uh, where you have, as, as um, I think Sofun was saying earlier, you need some champions in the community who will start to bring these pieces together for the betterment of, of the community and then start to, to bring the players, uh, bringing those, those policies and programs together that, that start to create the fertile ground for a healthy entrepreneurial ecosystem. I, I will say from, from my perspective, uh, you know, as terrible as this pandemic uh, is, I think we will look back on it and uh, and see that it dramatically accelerated the globalization of entrepreneurship. Uh, every you know board that I'm sitting on, um, companies are you know looking far and wide for talent, for technology, for uh, investments, for acquisition, uh, because we've really been liberated from you know bricks and mortars in many respects, and we're learning how to uh, uh, how to how to operate across borders and and virtually uh, through you know, sessions like this. So, uh, and, and we are seeing governments, um, you know, engaging more in promoting entrepreneurship and, and technical innovation in local areas. Um, any other comments on this uh, question before I move on uh, to the next one for uh, Swepal? Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, look at this uh, startup generally go through what you call is a metamorphosis process, right? At every stages of their life cycle, there's a challenge, right? I mean, we, we even in the UA, it's not an exception, like right? we have a, um, like a large, large sovereign fund, we have a large fund who can cater to the need of Series A and O, right? Uh, but when it comes to even like looking at the pre-seed or seed, um, there are not enough, um, you know, angel, angel investor, or there are, but there's not enough uh, awareness there. Uh, the family offices are there kind of look at mostly like co-investing, which means you need to still find an investor, right, to go or tap them. Um, and so there, there are amazing like early stage to kind of a uh, growth stage startups are there. But but there are not enough uh, funds are there to kind of support them. So like Robert mentioned, it's like a kind of phenomena of a value of death or like missing the middle, right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot that vacuum needs to be filled to attract more and more funds to comes to this region. Mm -hmm. I wanted to comment also on what you both just said um, about what government can do. How can they redistribute wealth in a way that's effective? So you mentioned partake in incubator or accelerators, true. There are also uh, ways that would foster investment that cost nothing virtually. Like I have the example in France uh, that a few years back um, just passed a very simple law about 
um, dividend taxation and um, how you would be taxed when you exit your company. And this was very simple, flat tax, that's it. You know exactly what you're getting into when you exit. And because they committed to make that a stable framework, people decided to that, yeah, they have the stability and now they're willing to invest more. And that stability did more to push the amount of investment that the tax break they gave to people who invested in startups. That's one example. Mm -hmm. um, another example that could foster uh, entrepreneurship and push started beyond um, the value of death, this one costs money, is um, unemployment. Both in France and in Germany, for instance, uh, after you leave your job, you're entitled to unemployment. And during that time, you can start your own company. So basically you're paid by the state to run and operate your startup. It can be up to two years. That, that kind of safety net really empowers the entrepreneurs um, and founders to go uh, reach and fetch the success that they want. It's interesting. Uh, we have an office in France and uh, we've seen an explosion of entrepreneurship in, in the last uh, three or four years. Um, uh, and, and valuations, which used to be uh, incredibly low, uh, at, as in Hungary, <laughs> have, have exploded. So uh, yeah. government well, policies well. seem to be working because, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you wouldn't do a startup in France. Yeah. And the virtual circle have uh, emerged, whereas the entrepreneurs that have exited and have made money from themselves, contrary to all money, where it was more real estate and capital market, they put it back into startups. Mm -hmm. A lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, disregarding the traditional um, allotment of your wealth. Uh, that you would do conservatively. They're very aggressively invested into startups mm -hmm. and that fuels the machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, so it can be done. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. So, uh, uh, Swepal, um, uh, how are regulators in your country uh, supporting the development of ecosystem funding? So I think the regulator here is doing quite good. Uh, one example which I could share is with, uh, I mean, I spent time between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, but in, especially in Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi Global Market, ADGM, um, has been really attracting a lot of funds to these regions. Uh, they have, you know, made the whole regime very investor friendly, uh, where you know, investors were uh, not required to any uh, put to share capitals, or even in terms of their, you know, the manpower or the, the sort of a, the team needed, so you can outsource, like a, for example, finance officers or compliance or uh, you know MLRO roles. So there's a lot of uh, benefits or attractions for this uh, startup. There's a very, it's a very you know tax, tax attractive regime, and also if you look at uh, uh, the, the cost of setting up the uh, fund is very very uh, very very reasonable nominal. So so that's that sort of. Uh, Kind of, uh, you can see the regulators playing a role as well as they're creating their own uh, sandbox, whether it's a fintech or rec lab. So I could see that uh, would create, uh, you know, uh, attract a lot of lot of uh, fund from different part of the world to look at entering into the uh, into the UAE. Mm -hmm. uh, other other comments on uh, regulators, Yulia? Any any observations in Central Europe? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of regulators are are working on building ecosystems and providing funding for these ecosystems, and uh, I think it's definitely helping. So we see that the ecosystem is growing, and there's uh, more and more startups, more initiatives. So that's that's very good. Um, I think one one important thing that is still missing the link is that all this um, capital, public capital, should be spent in a way that it attracts also more private capital. So, so that, that link is, is still missing how to 
uh, a track both, for example, how it was done in Israel back in 93 with the HOSMA program where um, government was giving um, public money uh, with the requirement that each fund has to bring in private investors from abroad. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that really helped all that uh, international cap- capital go into Israel. So I think in our region, this is one thing that's still really missing. And a lot of VC funds that are fundraising um, also run into challenges of investors still being a little bit um, cautious about the Central European region. They don't really know much about the Central European region. So that's definitely something that um, it's great that we have a lot of uh, help from from regulators in terms of funding the ecosystem and and having programs, but it should somehow be connected more with international private investors um, down the road. Do you see those trends changing uh, at all? Any examples of moving more to, towards an Israeli system? To be honest, regulators are not really, um, unfortunately. So so. Th- most of the capital is still just just mostly um, public capital that is going into the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, we, Hungary in itself, uh, as previously mentioned, for, for startups, for example, it has great tax advantages um, for startups developing their IP here. So that's great. It also has very good quality of um, engineers at a very low and good cost. But they're not, regulators are not really focusing on tax breaks for possibly for investors bringing their money here. So that, for example, could be something that we've, we've been trying to get through to, to regulators to somehow help the ecosystem this way so that we attract capital from outside of this uh, region and outside of public money um, so that this ecosystem can um, grow in the long term. Mm-hmm. You know, so some of it comes down to also just good marketing. Um, you know, having having watched Israel you know grow over the years, uh, you know, of course, the uh, you know, the military intelligence and the technology coming out of there, you know, was kind of bigger than life, uh, mm-hmm. you know, all the way over here in Silicon Valley. So some of it is is just, you know, governments also sort of promoting, uh, you know, particularly the technical talent, the, the low cost of doing business, uh, uh, government programs and, and so on. Definitely. Uh, other other comments, you know, Robert, regulators in uh, in Nova Scotia and, and Canada? Yeah. I- I think it's it's a a little bit of a slippery slope because we can't become overly dependent on on the regulator or on government. And I, I think that again, getting back to this idea that Sofin was talking about earlier on, if you can find champions and they may be in government or they may be in academia or they may be in the private sector, but again, bringing these groups together, for the common purpose of building, you know, a entrepreneurial ecosystem in the region uh, and developing, you know, sets of activities where there's an alignment. And this is what, if you look at Norway or if you look at Israel, is this ability to align, if you like, government, academia, the larger private sector, uh, to align them around the commitment to the development of the ecosystem. And that starts to de-risk the capital because people see a collective aligned approach. Uh, and, and so this, this enabling role that, that I would say, again, um, government or regulators can play in, in developing, yes, policies help the right kinds of incentive policies, but then getting creative with them and building this overall ecosystem. And I think there, again, there are things that can come out uh, that help when you look at the, the, the mechanisms, particularly again, in early stage, there's a program that grew out of the University of Toronto called the Creative Destruction Lab process. And, and this is an important part of the, the, um, the ecosystem that doesn't get talked a lot about um, uh, that helps the US ecosystem be successful. And that's the process of mentoring. So it's intelligent capital. It isn't just the capital. Mm-hmm. When there's a low level of, of experience, um, in even as Ron says, even in Silicon Valley, they, they've got 
entrepreneurs coming forward and they don't know how to write a business plan. They don't know how to identify their, their, their value prop. They don't know how to do a, a market scan to understand what the competitive set is um, when, they're, when they're bringing forward a proposal. But that's part of learning for a first time entrepreneur versus a serial entrepreneur. But I think having a system where you're combining mentorship and capital, even at the early stages, and this is a disappointment um, that I saw, particularly with tech investing, part of the capital, you know, uh, I've seen funds where they even a relatively small fund, you know, say, you know, 10 or $20 million would say, okay, look, what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to look at all these various opportunities and we're going to make 30 or 50 bets. And all we need to do is get one or two of those bets to come through and we're going to get a return on capital. Mm -hmm. But what I observed, which was much different because I come out of a more of a life science background is that there was no very little mentorship there. They weren't helping the thinking processes of those investors. And there were a lot of good ideas that went by the wayside because the entrepreneur wasn't provided the guidance along mm -hmm. with the capital. It was kind of like a survival of the fittest. And I thought that that was a missed opportunity. And when you get to higher levels of investment, VC capital or, or, or private equity capital, you see in the U.S. funds, you almost never go in there without there being someone in that fund who's actually built a business. Mm -hmm. So they're not a lawyer or an accountant or an MBA grad who does analysis. They actually understand how to build a company. Mm -hmm. And that level of mentorship is completely invaluable to to an early stage company mm -hmm. yeah i 100 percent agree and and uh you know i guess on on that point um the, the good news here in the in the valley is there's a trend to uh, uh investing earlier in startups again um you know kind of uh, promoted by uh, by the pandemic we can't do the kind of diligence we used to do uh, go on site to spend time with the you know the company get get to know the entrepreneurs and so on. We're really relying on Zoom and uh, and other techniques. So uh, we end up getting involved uh, with entrepreneurs much earlier, uh, and and really mentoring them to develop their uh, their business plans and and their go to markets and so on. And and there is more of a trend towards um, operational partners, if you will, and in, in venture firms here. I I spent thirty some odd years running companies and uh, and now I'm a partner at an early early stage fund. Um, so that's you know that's a positive development from my perspective and then programs like input here uh, that really promote mentorship. But I, I think that's a absolutely a key point. Um, uh, let's let's move on. Um, uh, Sophian, uh, apart from funding, what do you think uh, an early stage company needs to, to do to scale up on an international level. Uh, and can you uh, please describe accelerator or, or incubators in your ecosystem? Sure. Um, just before I answer two comments um, about a framework, um, I work a lot with Africa, um, mainly in West Africa. Um, and we've seen that uh, position adopted by government uh, to name them Tunisia uh, with the Startup Act and Senegal with their equivalent Startup Act um, have helped push the agenda because now it's easier to invest from a foreign, in, if you're a foreign investor, it's easier to buy and um, share, it's easier to uh, do rounds, less bureaucratic um, formalities to go to. Um, now in Senegal, you can set up a company in two days with very little capital. This used not to be like that. So that's quite a progress. Um, for, and to jump to say, I, I quite agree with you said Rob about mentoring. Um, one of the thing we're trying to do now with our new fund is to gather a pool of entrepreneurs that have exited themselves um, to co-invest as angels and mentor in the companies we bring forward. That's the condition. They have to be able to dedicate a little bit of time to the entrepreneurs and founder to support them. Um, 
and this is actually what is much needed for early stage companies. Um, money, money is essential, but smart money is way better. Mm -hmm. um, knowledge, no one can, take, can deprive you of your knowledge and you will use it, if not for this company, for the, for the next one. If you don't learn anything, we can give you as much money as you want, it will not help. Um, and so really this guidance is key. We've seen many companies approach us saying, we need that much money. And then re we realize, well, first, if you do that, you're gonna to be totally diluted and there are not gonna be any more rounds after that. But most of all, um, if you come to think about it in a strategic way, you don't need that much money. What you need is access to skills, access to talent, access to knowledge, access to partnerships, um, all things that a good VC uh, plus a pool of mentor can provide on, on the way to the scaling up. So you'd say that mentor, mentorship is, is uh, one of the most important elements to successful international scaling? I'd say access, I'd say knowledge, I'd say ways to reach out to um, the missing pieces of your machine, of your startups. Um, I, I can give you many examples where technology was key and it has been imported from one country to the other um, where people didn't speak the same language, didn't have the same cultural background, and yet the pieces fit together perfectly. And this bridge wouldn't have been possible if um, this person, this mentor, was not there to put two and two together. So it's about access. Yeah, I, I like to say in my role as a, as a mentor, my goal is that uh, my entrepreneurs uh, don't make the same mistakes that I made, they make new ones. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask each of you uh, uh, to, to tell me uh, a story of your uh, most influential or unique uh, global investment that was boosted by your ecosystems um, or an example of a successful startup in your ecosystem uh, but before I, I do that, I want to remind the, 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 the audience that uh, we're, we're open for, for questions. If there are any questions from the audience, we'd love to take them and get some audience interaction going. Um, so, Yulia, you want to start with a, with a story about a successful uh, startup, ideally on a global, global scale? Sure. We, from Hungary, we have a few success stories, um, maybe names that you have heard of as well. For example, um, Prezi or Ustream. And these are some names that have gone global from, from Hungary. Um, from, for all of the stories that went global from either Hungary or from the Central European region, I think it was key that they got international investors, private investors uh, into their capital quite soon. And, and they hustled to get that. And I think one, one thing that they had in common is that they were working with good mentors, good help. So that's, I think, definitely important. And um, we as Vespucci partners here in Hungary and in the Central European region are really working on um, connecting to the Central European region with a bridge towards mostly towards the US. And uh, we're really trying to build out these uh, hybrid models where we have uh, the startups development center stay here in the region, but take their sales, uh, marketing, management as soon as possible um, towards the US market or the other way around. So um, we actually have a company that we invested in. They have their um, headquarter in New Jersey and uh, their sales management is there and all their development is here in Hungary. So this way they're saving a lot of costs, taxes with having their development here. And we invested last year uh, in December and they had um, no revenue at all that then. And they're about to have $2 million of revenue this year. So they're, they're growing quite well and they're saving a lot with, with having their development here. So this international hybrid model works very successfully for them. And um, as previously mentioned, I think one really important thing is we're helping our startups go global and a lot of startups have that 
um, kind of challenge when from this going from the Central European region, it's all small markets. And uh, to jump to that level of going international into one bigger market, such as the US, they definitely need mentors and, and help and smart capital. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Swetal, a story from you? Uh, in, in Middle East, uh, we don't have many unicorns, right? I mean, we have seen uh, two successful uh, stories here uh, by you know, Soup, which is acquired by Amazon, and uh, Karim, which is acquired by Uber. Um, I think it's it was more of those success stories because there was like, you know, these guys, uh, I mean, the investor really helped them sort of reaching out to that level. And then we came the international giant and came and acquired by, you know, and, uh, entry, entered into this market by acquiring them. So these are the two success stories which I've seen, and there are many coming up. So it's a very young uh, ecosystem, which fledgling, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, so I think uh, more and more we could see in coming years in, in the UAE. Great. Good. Yeah. And, 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 you know, unicorns are, you know, of course, get all the news, but uh, it's, it's, you know, non-unicorns that make up the bulk of anybody's portfolio. So uh, many definitions of success. Sophian, sorry, sorry from you. In, in Africa, uh, what's been um, very, one of the segments that has been very booming is the fintech segment because mobile money is developed in the whole continent uh, like no other places on earth uh, for historical reason. The, um, and so we've seen recently a uh, huge success. So we, we could think about the pay stack that Tribe just acquired, uh, but uh, even in the Francophone region that I'm really focusing on, um, there is this company called InTouch, and they went on the whole continent um, developing the services with the help of foreign investments. That was key in their scaling up. Uh, we ourselves are trying to replicate this success with um, uh, a company called Simwa doing exactly the same thing, bringing money from the US into this West African company to help her scale up all over. What, what did InTouch do, um, Sofian? Uh, payment solution, uh, <clears throat> multi-canal. Like, if you think of one way to pay uh, digitally, they have it from anywhere to anywhere. Yeah, it's, it's uh, actually incredibly impressive how Africa has innovated uh, with digital uh, payment systems almost out of necessity. Uh, and and that's you know the beauty of of kind of global entrepreneurship is is that solutions necessitated by local conditions um, you know innovation can happen anywhere these days. Indeed. Robert, a story from you. Yeah, I can give you a, a couple of stories that are <clears throat> in different parts of the ecosystem here that are not unicorns. Um, you know, one is a, uh, a company that uh, is just a couple of years old out of uh, rural New Brunswick um, and uh, a, a small group uh, coming out of the university there developed an all-natural preservative for um, shelf-stable drinks. And through the Natural Products Canada Network, we invest, but not as a lead investor. So we have a small fund as well as the ecosystem development projects that we undertake as a center of excellence. We were able to attract with them, well, the company attracted them, but based on our uh, commitment to, to the project, they were able to attract over $2 million of capital. And their two other major investors came out, one out, one out of uh, San Francisco, the other out of Boston, um, a company called Ag Funder who understood you know, natural products and agricultural technology uh, emerging. And then that group was able to make a link and their first major customer was a major beverage company out of Japan. And so here's, here's a technology platform, you know, natural products uh, developed uh, as, a, as, a, as a small extract that gives us all natural. And so that's being introduced to different shelf stable drinks 
in a way that keeps them uh, keeps them safe biologically. Um, and coming out, so there you've got a product through through a network in the early stage incubation that they got, along with an investment that with us without being a leader that they could leverage into U.S. capital and a Japanese customer as their first breakthrough. Mm-hmm. Um, similarly, another another uh, group that was in the CDL uh, system in, in Halifax who came in with a, uh, a technology that was a tagging technology meant to potentially look at um, tagging fish and, and so forth. Um, that company soon identified that their technology and did a complete pivot out of that space that, that there was a big breakdown in, in the blood collection system across the world. As blood moves, a lot of the samples of blood get destroyed because of inappropriate movement. They can start to tag and even in hospitals who are now trying to you know, move blood samples to a blood lab you know, through different systems, moving them very, very rapidly, but with no quality control. And they could, they developed a technology where they could tag the, the blood samples as they uh, flowed through tubes and so forth through the hospital um, with massive quality control systems and improvement. And again, their uh, early stage funding came out of CDL, a group of entrepreneurs getting the mentoring, applying some early stage capital, and then their first major customer were hospitals in Denmark. So, so you can take these systems and apply them uh, and, and use the infrastructure that gets created uh, where these small companies, often your first major market is not your local market, depending on what your technology mm-hmm. platform is. Mm-hmm. So, so again, those are just a couple of examples. Mm-hmm. Great, great examples and, and also examples of how... Uh, Distinctive competencies in in a in a particular geography can can play out uh, globally. Well, listen, I'm I'm really excited now because we have questions from the audience. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask these, and uh, uh, I'll uh, just let you all jump in with answers. So the first is, uh, what is one piece of advice you would give entrepreneurs who need funding right in the middle of a pandemic? A good internet connection. Ah. <laughs> okay. Good. Necessary. Absolutely necessary. Yeah. And, and uh, probably actually no laughing matter because uh, we're, we're still nowhere near 100% in terms of penetration of broadband, even, even in developed countries. Other, other pieces of advice? And also, yeah. oh, just, sorry. just to follow on, um, uh being persistent because no from an investor today means no today maybe in six months it's different maybe in three months it's different so try and try and try again if you have something new to show up for go ahead Mm -hmm. yep as i like to say you've got to kiss a lot of frogs to find a prince yeah another thing i would say is um, definitely what we see is a lot for a lot of our startups, it's, it, it gets harder to close deals, but you can still work on building your sales pipeline. So when you go to an investor and because of the pandemic, um, maybe you have a difficulty uh, with, uh, with actually showing revenues as you expected before the pandemic and maybe it slowed down a little bit, but really try to work any angle, any creative angle on, on traction, even if it's a little bit different kind of traction and maybe it's your sales pipeline grow, grow, growing with actually um, closing deals as much as you wanted before but still somehow showing that investor that you're not lost and 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 you're coming out on the other end and there's still a large potential in your startup okay uh, other um i think if I, if you look at the startups they they need to assess their own, you know, uh, cash flow projections. You know, if you, you look at what's, uh, you know, what's your runway, right? Do you have enough dry powder to su- sustain? You know, if not, can you be frugal? You know, run the business in a more frugal way, save more cost uh, before you go for tapping funding because 
during pandemic it's it's uh, it's not that there's no fund with the investor do they some of them you know raise the fund before uh, before pandemic from lp so they some of them have money to deploy but it's look at from investor perspective, perspective also i mean it's a paradox like uh, whether to kind of bail out their you know some of their ailing portfolio companies or to look for investing into new port, new you know new opportunities so i think it's a very it's a it's a time where both sides need to be looked at very carefully especially the startup you know uh, really come with a great plan great uh, cash flow projections and a great strategy uh, to attract the investor mm -hmm. and i would also say definitely look at what where the world is going to be after pandemic so post pandemic obviously we 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 see we don't invest for half a year one year but we're looking at five to seven years of ranges but definitely try to look at where your industry is going after the pandemic post pandemic and if you have to if you need to then, then definitely um pivot and show you that show the investors that you're ready for the post pandemic world and how you're going to excel um afterwards mm -hmm. Great. Let me let me get a few more now. The questions are coming uh, fast. Just, and, let, me, and John, let me just say something here about mindset. Um, let me get a little philosophical here for a second. Um, you know, the pandemic created a lot of uncertainty, and what most people's mindset is that they they're thinking about uncertainty or as something that is a problem that they need to solve to get to back to a more certain place. The truth of the matter is uncertainty is a fact. It's not a problem to be solved. And so your mindset has to be one is that I'm living in an uncertain world. There is a lot of unknowns. And then in, in focusing back on, you know, what is the quality of my offer? All the pandemic does, all COVID does is reveal and accelerate. So it reveals the truth of a situation and accelerates life or death more quickly. And so the quality of the offer that you're making is to go back and not be thinking about pandemic. There's lots of capital available. All of the capital that's available is trying to find deals the same way as deals are trying to find capital in a largely now online world. The issue still comes back to what is the quality of the offer that you're making? Are you able to clearly ar ar articulate your value proposition and can so look at yourself you need to get better if you're not raising capital that's the bottom line mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well and I, i'd say the, the corollary to that uh, robert is there's opportunity uh, in anything uh and yeah. and you know as an example uh, telemedicine is has been dramatically uh, accelerated uh you know here here in the united states you know no one delivered healthcare you know, over video, it, it just wasn't, you know, HIPAA, all these regulations and so on. And then of course the pandemic hit and all of a sudden, guess what? Everybody's delivering uh, medicine over uh, over Zoom and, uh, and other technologies. And that's creating huge opportunities, you know, remote, you know, remote learning, many other areas, there's opportunities. Um, let me move on because we've got a, a lot of questions now, which I'm thrilled about. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, again, for all of you, do you think that the media as a stakeholder uh, has a big role to play in bringing in other investors? Media, comments on that? Media plays a big role in creating a lot of awareness, you know, like what are the deeds happening, what's in, you know, uh, what startup is doing, um, you know, what are the new opportunities, what's happening in other part of the world. I think it, it is media plays a lot of uh, role in that sense. Uh, I think that creating the awareness is most important. Uh, I have not seen where it can attract the investors, uh, you know, but uh, I would like to hear from other panelists. But I think awareness is most definitely important in that way you can attract even maybe the investor from other part of the world look at, you know, maybe, for example, seeing, oh, there's a lot happening in UA, you know, uh, why not look at uh, investing in the UA, for example, if, if media talks a lot about this, the startup growth, uh, uh, you know, the attractions in the market. Other comments on media? I would definitely agree that, yeah, media and branding is very important both for, say, a country to attract capital, also for a startup 
to be able to attract capital because it really brings awareness and and you might have a hidden gem say technology or something but if it's hidden somewhere no one knows about it then it's hard for it to attract capital and investors but obviously if it's get if it gets a big awareness um you know just just thinking about a few startups in the past that that had this not even all of them were successful but I think definitely um, having media and bringing awareness can help bring in investors. I would agree with that. And that, that's another piece of advice uh, I would be keen on giving to entrepreneurs. Communicate about what you're doing. Don't just do that yourself or your team and try to have the perfect project because before you talk about it. Share your vision. There's something you want to accomplish. That's why you're funding the startup. What is it? Tell, tell people about it. And the more you talk about it, the more help you're going to get along the way. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I don't fully understand the question. But, uh, you know, having been there myself, particularly in, in ecosystems that are just emerging, everybody's eager to find, a, you know, a success story. And uh, my view would be to not seek out media to talk about your company, um, particularly in a local context, depending on where your customers are. The thing is to focus in on creating value for your customer. And anything that takes your attention away in a, at an early stage from focusing on the value creation and building your capacity to create that value from the, for the customer is distracting you and wasting time and ultimately wasting capital. So focus, don't get distracted by shiny objects. And, and if you're doing a good job and your company is, is, is building a success story, media will come, and local media, and, and talk about that. And that will be a distract, distraction because everybody in the local community will want to talk to you about, you know, and you hold you up as an example and have you off speaking all over the place. So I think you have to be careful. Um, again, I don't know the exact context the question was, was asked, but the most important thing is figuring out who your specific customers are and how you can create value for them. That's the most important thing an entrepreneur should do, and anything that's taking them away from that is not time well spent. Yeah, I, I, uh, I certainly agree that that's first and, and foremost. I, I thought the question was quite interesting because I have come to believe in my career that uh, uh, media exposure, especially uh, popular press, uh, general press, and, and business press is, is kind of the best marketing money can't buy. Um, I've, I've had uh, two instances, one early stage startup that uh, uh, got uh, very uh, large exposure in, in the popular press, and that led you know, directly to funding interest. And then in another case, uh, a, uh, a, a general article that appeared in Fortune magazine led to uh, a very accretive acquisition by one of my companies. Um, so obviously, if you don't, Robert, have, have a fundamental story to tell that uh, it, you know, the press can get excited about, you're not going to get the press and it's a waste of time. On the other hand, uh, uh, if you can engage the popular press with, with a compelling story, uh, it can be hugely beneficial. Um, let's move on. Uh, another interesting question is, does dependency on government funding create long-term sustainability and competitiveness issues uh, for an ecosystem? Julia, what do you think? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer this one. It's, it's quite common here. Um, it definitely creates challenges and it definitely decreases um, competitiveness, in my opinion. So. I think all, all funds, even if even if it's not um, regulation led and not government led, should focus on um, creatively bringing in capital, private capital, and and not just from within their country, but possibly from international investors, because it also helps then those investors help their startup scale to next level, bringing in a in a bigger network and and with a bigger network, more help, more. Um, mentors for their startups. So I definitely think that if it's just um, just public money in a market, then public money doesn't necessarily invest for the same reasons as private money, as previously this has been um, 
we we talked about this previously and and with public money they don't definitely look at returns so obviously it might not be as competitive so definitely yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. other comments on uh, the risk of government funding <laughs> Yeah, I mean, government funding, you know, there's a, in this region, there's several funds that are, if you like, pseudo government, they're funded by government, uh, even though they've got non government folks managing those funds, early stage uh, funds. Um, I think the biggest risk that I've seen isn't so much reducing competitiveness, is that, that the ecosystem over time, the early stage companies can get a little bit what, what I call lazy. Uh, and so they'll go back for multiple rounds of smaller investment and get trapped in this kind of small cycle of you know, raising a half a million dollars and continuing on. And one of the, the things with these government funds, even if they've got some professional managers, is um, they don't like to kill companies or ideas. So every idea is not worthy you know, every startup company is not worthy um, because it's an idea. It's a possibility that needs to be brought into fruition. That doesn't mean that they were bad or stupid. It's just, Hey, there was an idea. And then either the market didn't evolve or the product couldn't evolve to address the market need. And so this unwillingness to, to kill bad ideas, but more significantly getting trapped in this cycle of kind of constantly raising small rounds of funding to stay alive rather than what's my actual value proposition. I can give you an example of a company that, that I was board chair for early on and they got trapped in that cycle, forced the company to look at what were their, was their true valuation. Then they broke out of that small cycle, did a, did a series A at 7 million and a year and a half later did a $30 million uh, um, uh, round um, all with the, all with international financing. So they got it's breaking out of that local that addiction to the local small amounts of capital that kind of keep me going. And I haven't really, as a company, you know, you know, been able to articulate where is this really going and is it worthy of follow-on investment. So that's the danger, I think. Mm -hmm. Other comments on uh, risks of. Being too dependent on government funding, Swetal? Um, in my view, if the government funding is in the form of sort of a free money or grant, right, where you, where there's no clear measurable KPIs or goal, then it's dangerous because that leads to, you know, a startup kind of generally leads to complacent um, goal setting, ineffective management, ineff inefficient operations. I think that's that's a very dangerous zone. But if the fund is very innovative fund where it can, you know, uh, help scaling up the business, uh, for example, there is a one in, in Dubai called uh, Mohammed bin Rashid Innovation Fund. They support startup providing a very, um, uh, the venture door debt, it's at a kind of a, uh, without any collateral security, right? And it's a very, very cheap uh, interest rate. So, so those kind of uh, debt which can motivate and help them to bridge the gap before they raise their equity. Also, it, because it's, it's, it's not an equity, it helps them to build their valuation. So those kind of a fund, I believe it's uh, in most innovative fund is very helpful for the startup. Okay. An another interesting question uh, for you all, is there a uh, uh, hype in impact investing and funding? Julia? You're nodding your head, yes. I, I, as far as I see, definitely, yeah. So this impact investing has definitely seen a hype, um, both from in, uh, from from LP sides, also down to VCs investing into startups. So I think I think impact investing has definitely seen a hype. Um, I think it's an interesting thing, an interesting concept, and uh, our fund has actually dedicated to investing at least thirty percent of our fund uh, into green technology. So. We somehow are also um, working towards this. And um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting new component of, of investing, not just for a return, but for other um, specific criteria. Interesting here in the United States, uh, of course, there's lots of talk about impact investing and uh, you know, VC funds are, are starting to kind of modify their investment criteria 
on the other hand, LPs all want, you know, maximum return on invested capital and IRR and so on. And we're still wrestling with how to, you know, how to kind of bring the two together. They're really uh, conflicting in many respects. Yeah, uh, other comments right. on impact investing? No, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, for, for many years, impact investing has been seen as low return investment or none at all. It was close to philanthropic investment. And now LPs want to get into impact investment, but they still want to, cons to, to keep the return they had. So there's a contradiction in term that uh, we struggle to, to accommodate here. Mm -hmm. Robert? What's happening in Canada? Uh, well, I guess I should comment here, given that I run an impact investment fund. So, um, you know, I, I think that we have to be careful about definition here. Uh, and, and I think the, you know, what is an impact investment fund? Uh, the definition of that is, is morphing. Like Sophie was saying, the fund that I run is targeted on a, on and trying to create a paradigm shift related to the ocean. And that requires more patient capital. The timeline and the return on that capital are, are much different than a, a traditional, you know, PE fund or, or VC fund. Uh, and we have had dialogues with lots of funds who have, if you want to call it eco friendly or understanding that there's an emerging uh, market where consumers understand, I mean, what the pandemic has shown us is that we live in an interconnected world. And that quite frankly, you know, uh, as humans, we have had this um, kind of blind spot that somehow humans are one part of the global ecosystem and uh, all other animals and, and nature are kind of a separate ecosystem when in reality, we're all interconnected. And so there was an emerging awareness that we need solutions that are uh, respectful of the entire envir environment. And so in traditional funds, they're going to have a renewed focus or a new focus on those, uh, um, you know, more, uh, if you want to call it circular economy uh, objectives or things that are related to ocean sustainability and so forth. Um, what we have to keep in mind is that do those traditional funds still have the traditional returns on capital that are required? Mm -hmm. And so where you're going for funding, you know, you know, you have to understand that yes, they're going to, to, you know, look for opportunities that are in that eco uh, sphere, if you like, and they're still gonna to have to have the traditional returns. And so is what you're trying to do going to fit inside that mandate or does it require some longer, more patient capital approach and you still have to make the case for it? Um, so I think it's, it's separating and making distinctions in, 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 in to what you're actually calling impact investing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I wish we had more time to, uh, uh, to, to dig into the, you know, sort of the, the conflict between uh, maximizing returns and, 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 you know, doing good for the long term. Um, but we have five minutes left, and I'm going to uh, ask each of you to, uh, to summarize in, in 30 seconds um, your overall view on, uh, uh, on building and, and using ecosystems to develop uh, and accelerate startups. Um, uh, before I do, I, we may run out of time, and, and I want to thank you all and, and the audience for a terrific panel. Your contributions uh, uh, have been really helpful, and all the questions that came from the audience uh, was really encouraging to, to me. Um, so 30 seconds on, uh, uh, on a summary here. Who wants to start? An opportunity for a soundbite that can uh, appear in the ITU newsletter. Um, I can start. So I think, uh, of course, uh, startups needs to tap on the very good network of the you know ecosystems. Talk to the uh, key stakeholders of the ecosystem, key player of the ecosystem. But 
But even if there is a, not a right ecosystem, be be a hustler, be a street smart, find your way to navigate into the you know to scale up your business. Okay, very good, very succinct. Thanks, Sweetal. I would say that startups should find investors that then have a channel to other investors and then can help the startup scale. So not just not just one investment, but from there on. Um, they're put onto a track where they're not alone with their fundraising, but they do get help to go uh, forward in that channel. Okay, Julia, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, offer two pieces of, of advice. One for the startup, the startup companies themselves. The biggest question you have to ask as early as you can is who cares? Who cares about the product or service that you're providing? and your ability to identify who cares and how you create value for them determines whether you've got a, 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 a business worthy of capital uh, investment. In terms of the ecosystem, I think the ecosystem requires for seed capital, you need champions. And those champions then have to build collaboration across the entire community to build a larger ecosystem than just seeking out capital. So there's a larger ecosystem supporting the building up of, a, of an entrepreneurial set and an entrepreneurial community uh, in, uh, in, inside that startup community. And I would say that, of course, ecosystems are needed and essential to support the startup growth. But this pandemic for me, I see it as an opportunity because your ecosystem now is not local anymore. Mm -hmm. It's global. Mm -hmm. And through this more than this, this new habits we're developing, you're able to find people that cares, like Robert said, anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a local ecosystem, mm -hmm. reach out worldwide. Mm -hmm. You'll find people that care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would offer three things. One, and, and really we talked about them all, is uh, there's opportunity in, in everything, uh, including you know a terrible global pandemic, you just have to look for it and take advantage of it. Second is, you know, even even as, you know, sort of maybe nationalism is taking hold in, you know, many parts of, of the globe, um, entrepreneurship is really, you know, going global and, and we're distributing entrepreneurship in a way we never have before. Uh, and then finally, seek mentorship, uh, you know, seek people who have done it before, who uh, have connections uh, in the global economy just reach out to everybody you can and, and be a sponge. Um, well, listen, we're at the top of the hour. I wanna thank you all very much. Thanks to the audience. This has been a, a terrific panel uh, and you all have a good morning, afternoon and evening. Thanks very much. Thank you.